good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, welcome to you all. We're just going to, we see that people are entering the room. I just wanted to take the opportunity to welcome you all so we can begin. Um, we will be running for about one and a half hours. So um, going to begin very shortly, just as soon as uh, we have everybody in the room. And I'm sure that there will be people joining as we go along. My name is Josh Ogada, and I am the Secretariat Lead for the African Climate Action Partnership. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome you to this webinar uh, held, you know, thank you to Sarah and the team and the rest of our partners in enabling us to bring you this webinar on promoting ICS for reaching ND NDC targets. Specifically, we're going to be looking at unlocking scalar potentials, professionalization for long-term sustainable market growth. Um, as I said, we are going to be running for about one and a half hours, and during that time, we will have the opportunity to listen to some presentations, uh, as well as have an opportunity um, for feedback and uh, questions and answers. Um, yeah, just very just to touch on a couple of things in terms of in terms of housekeeping. Um, but before we do that, maybe just to uh, look at the agenda very quickly for the time that we will have together. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, just as soon as I finish with the introduction, we are going to have an introduction uh, to the project by uh, Jackson Mutonga is going to be telling us a little bit about this work. And then we will look at the different aspects of the approach, why this approach is important, uh, looking at uh, you know market readiness for scaling around ICS as well as key design elements to the approach. Then we will have uh, some time to listen to a presentation um, on around implementation from Senegal. Um, and then we will also have the same from Kenya. Then we'll spend some time in breakout groups before we come back together to share the findings of our breakout groups and the, uh, the findings of our discussions. Then we will have the opportunity to close out the webinar. Next slide, please. I probably should have pointed this out right from the start, uh, bearing in mind that we have uh, we're going to be operating this uh, this uh, webinar in two languages. So on the screen you see the instructions um, for uh, accessing the inter interpretation services. You will notice that uh, on the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, towards the right hand side, there's an interpretation icon. Um, which you should be able to click on and choose the language you'd like to hear. For today's webinar, as I mentioned, we have French language interpretation. So if you are Francophone, then you should be able to click on that button and indicate French as your choice of language, which will then enable you to hear the language, in this case, French, or if when our French speaker is speaking, you should be able to hear English and you should be able to hear it at about 80% of the volume. Uh, and 20% in the original language. If you'd like to hear it entirely in the language, you can deactivate the original sound so that you hear it fully in the language of your choice. So that is interpretation. If any of you have uh, encountered any problems uh, with accessing this functionality, please just uh, pop a message in the chat box and we shall make sure we try and resolve it for you. An important point around interpretation before we close out on that subject is because we are operating in both languages, we would just like to ask that the panelists, presenters, and anybody who's asking questions to try and make themselves as clear as possible and to measure the cadence of your speech in order for everybody to be able to follow along in the interpreted language. And we would be very grateful for that. But we hope to have a, a smooth webinar uh, going forward and to be able to operate smoothly in both languages. Next slide, please. Great. And at this point, uh, it is my pleasure to hand over to Mr. Jackson Mutonga to give us an introduction uh, to our discussion for today. Welcome, Jackson. Thank you, Josh. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, good day, colleagues, uh, good day, partners, friends, and um, associates from wherever you are in the world. It's such a pleasure to host you today um, from our side. Uh, excited about the discussions which we are going to have today. 
My name is Jackson Mutonga. I'm the project manager for this uh, GCF BMZ Finance project, promotion of climate friendly cooking in Kenya and Senegal. I'm in charge of the Kenyan component. And uh, it's, it's a project which we have been implementing in the last four years, uh, basically looking at the transformation of the improved cooking stock uh, subsector. So to say, we are focusing on the rural and peri-urban households because, as we understand, in sub-Saharan Africa, the transition. In Africa Austral, the transition to prepare with the biomass, it will take us. And it's really an improvement compared to the tradition for the cuisson. Et nous allons nous focaliser sur le domaine et nous travaillons aussi avec le gouvernement, avec les cibles. Their NDCs. So together with Senegal and our colleagues from AQ, uh, we are focusing both on the supply side as well as the demand side of the improved cookstops. And uh, before the project, of course, the traditional production of the uh, cookstops was the artisanal level. And uh, our idea was to transform this supply side uh, to more professional level. And that is what we are focusing on today. We have uh, learned quite a lot. We have done quite a lot and there's still a lot to be done. So we invite you today to hear from us what we have experienced, the approaches which we are making, and also to for us to hear from you and to learn together on uh, areas uh, where you have also learned from your own experiences and ideas on what can be improved and what can be done later and uh, also sharing on our documentation and sharing of these uh, lessons beyond uh, the project so it's very important for us to have you on board and we encourage uh, an open discussion uh, feel free to ask questions uh, feel free to give your inputs uh, so that we can uh, build together this knowledge and make it useful uh, in our day-to-day -day work and transitioning our regions to more sustainable cooking technologies and methodologies. So I don't want to preempt what my colleagues will be presenting because uh, quite a lot and exciting information is coming along. So welcome all and uh, look forward to interacting. Thank you. Thank you, Jackson. So with that, I will take over and give you a short introduction on what is important about this approach and give you also a quick introduction on the design elements of the approach. So basically, the first question that comes to mind, we want to, with this webinar, introduce an approach that we have developed with the project, which is the professionalization approach to basically scale up um, ICS markets in one country very quickly. So basically the first question that comes to mind is why do we need this approach? Why is this important? And to also provide a bit of background on this generally, I think everyone working in the cooking sector already knows this. Around 12% of the global energy use is traditional biomass and still 2.3 billion people are cooking with traditional biomass. The goal of us all is to reach the SDG, so the universal access to modern energy cooking services for all. And based part, apart from this, this also has the huge potential to uh, climate mitigation, since cooking is also anchored in a lot of, like I think around 30 countries and NDCs at the moment. It reduces the pressure on forest and improves biodiversity reduces self other hazards and also reduces the expenses on wood fuel use. So basically the professionalization approach to put it in a nutshell wants to scale up clean cooking via market-based approach. So the idea is to build like a solid, reliable national stove market that is able to cater the demand of the market and thereby focusing on the professionalization of the ICS production. They were basically focusing on supporting ICS producers that are already in the market existing, helping them to scale up their production and thereby being able to reach a wider market and also reach rural areas in the market. So that is basically the core of the professionalization approach that we're gonna to present today to you then what are the success factors of the approach? So I think these are maybe the three, four key success factors of the professionalization approach um, that are there. So on one hand, apologies, yeah, no. 
So one hand is that you basically focus not focus more on the professional ICS businesses that are already in the market or the businesses that produce improved cookstoves that are already there and successful. So it's basically a performance based top up. So thereby you support the players that are already in the market and that have the potential to scale up bigger. Then, as said, the second one is that it's performance based. So you look at the performance of the uh, ICS producers and scale the ones that are performing well up. And also you not only look at the performance side and at the production side, but you also look at the distribution side, um, link it up with the ICS productors, and then also next to it, have a look at the demand and enabling environment to have a holistic approach. And in terms of our project um, with this approach, we are also a mitigation project. So thereby we are also contribution, contributing to the NDC targets of Kenya and Senegal by implementing the approach and then basically, is it successful? At the moment, we can say yes, and that's why we're also presenting it to you. Here you can see the example of Senegal, uh, where you can see that if you look at the ICS sales in the past years during the project, um, there's a clear exponential increase of the ICS sales. So we can really say this approach works for scaling up cooking interventions. And that's also why we want to use the chance today in this webinar to present the approach to you and dive into more detail on the approach on how you can basically develop a sustainable long-term market growth of ICS via this approach, because yeah, as you have seen in the numbers, we still have a long way to go to reach universal access to clean cooking. Now, let me dive a bit deeper into the key design elements or the key elements of the approach. So basically, the first one, that's the first question that pops up when thinking about implementing the professionalization approach is the question, is your target market ready for scaling? So basically for implementing the approach, it is important to look at the ICS market that is currently in your country and check, is there already a sufficiently large market potential in the country and that focusing on domestically produced ICS, so domestically produced improved cook stoves. Because in some markets, for example, there is not yet, they are mostly imported stoves and there is not yet a large potential for locally produced stoves. And the approach is focusing on local production within the ICS market of your country. And then also looking at the demand side, is there already demand for improved cook stoves or does this demand needs to be first created? For that, it helps to do a systematic ICS market assessment. So basically assess if the market has already a pioneering stage, thereby looking a bit which stove types are available, what actors are in the market, um, is the value chain or is there already a volatile chain? What is the policy develop, develop environment? Is there, are there access to finance opportunities? What are the quality regulations, norms and standards? And with that also identify key barriers. And with the pioneering stage, we mean that the product that is introduced in this terms, the improved cook stove, uh, is relatively unknown and has not yet earned the trust of the consumers, but they and a small amount, but there is already a small amount or amount of them in the market, and there is already a demand in the market for the improved cook stove. So we are not in the first stage where they're basically the product is not yet in the market. And that basically gives the perfect starting positions for this approach and enables then this approach to successfully kick off. And with that, we want to move to a little activity. So it would be great if you could join the mentee. We'll also post the link in the chat um, as or scan the QR code. So we'll also have two questions to basically get this webinar going. Let me give one second to share the screen. There you go. Also let us know if you cannot for some reason join the mentee. Mm. 
One second. Now it's working. So please all join the Menti. Let me know. So basically what we want to ask as key questions is if you look at your country context, what are the key barriers for clean cooking in your country context? So we already have two answers, which I think are very important. Social acceptance, reliability, access to finance is always a big problem. Feel free to also post further questions feel uh, or points. Feel free to post them also in French. Um, yeah, what are the key barriers in your country context for clean cooking or access to clean cooking? Is this more on the demand side? Oh, there we have access to finance as a big problem. Um, since numerous people have already pointed that out, are there other problems? Social demand we have here, acceptability, affordability, also a big question and a big issue. The lack of quality products. So basically what kind of products are in the market okay now we see them coming in the enforcement of standards yes that's also a big problem so are there even standards for clean cooking yet for example for improved cookstoves in a lot of countries there are no standards yet or standards are in the development the efficiency also an issue the awareness of ICS yes we'll come to that also in a bit great do we have some more points otherwise we'll move to the next question. So basically, I hope you can read it. I've tried to also write it in English and French. So basically, if you now would look a bit at the ICS market in your country, at what market stage would you think the ICS market is? Is it more in a pre-conversion stage, which means that there's only a few ICS in the market, there's not really demand, and things are not are really at the beginning. Are you in a pioneering phase, which is basically for our approach, the perfect stage where ICS are present, there is already a demand, but consumers are maybe not 100% trusting the process and are still in the process. Um, are you already in the expansion phase where there are new ICS producers coming into the market? sellers, distributors, everyone is entering into the market. The market is moving forward. There is an increasing demand, the maturity phase, where you already have a lot of different players in the market. Prices are dropping due to economies of scale. There's a growing competition. Everyone is moving in the market or in the saturation phase, where basically the market competition becomes harder and harder. There's too many players in the market, and basically it is really hard for players to enter the market. And that means the market is already developed. Okay, I've seen five people in the pioneering phase. That's really great. Two people in the expansion phase, one pre-commercial, and then there are two in the maturity phase. Anyone else, feel free to also click three in the expansion phase. Okay, that I think gives a very interesting picture on the different markets in the different countries. Okay, great. So I think we have a good solid picture where like most of the markets are either in the pioneering phase. Yeah, and one more in the pioneering. So I think this is really great to see seven in the pioneering because that's exactly where the approach that we are going to present today in more detail, same as with the expansion, has a good point to dock on and basically scale the development that is already happening in the markets, scale already what's happening in the market. So yeah great to see that a lot of them are already in the pioneering phase or expansion phase. And with that, we'll move back to the presentation. Thank you all for participating in this little exercise. So now we're going to move a bit more into what are the key design elements of the approach. So what are the key elements that make this approach so special? And so what is like the key unique selling points of the approach? So basically the first unique selling point of the approach is the categorization of the ICS producers. When thinking about the approach and implementing the approach, wanting to professionalize the ICS producers, it's important to look at the market and especially look at the ICS producer landscape in the market 
And basically the objective of this is to really define targeted support for the ICS producers so that they're able to scale up their production, but make standardized support because it is really, if you have a big ICS producer base, for example, in Senegal, we are supporting over 250 producers, then it's really hard to make really individual packages. So the idea is to develop targeted standardized support packages for the ICS producers based on their need. And for that, it's really important to consult with the ICS producers, identify current production levels, in the specific context and challenges. And then basically what we've done in the project is we group them, but you can also group them into one to three categories. So artisanal producers that produce 30 to 100 stoves a month, intermediate producers producing up to a thousand a month and business class producers. And with that, we've basically for each defined this threshold, how big the production is to then basically look at these three groups and target the support needs based on their based on their needs and based on the groupings that we did to thereby provide more specific targeted support, but in a standardized manner. Then the second unique selling point is what I've already said, the standardization of support packages. So basically, after grouping these ICS producers into these three different categories and basically evaluating their needs based on these three categories, um, we have developed then standardized support packages. And thereby the objective is on one hand to have a simplified procurement pro process, but also as said before, be able to provide targeted support, but also be able to cater a high amount of ICS producers with the support. So basically the support packages consist of two kind of categories Generally speaking, on one hand, it's basically kits of materials or machinery that has basically can have a can have a big range of, for example, hand tools like pliers, hammers, can also include manual machines like rulers or cutting machines, also electric machines like, for example, welding machines. So this depends also on your country context, how the improved cookstoves is produced in your country context what machinery is needed and especially looking at, but also later the two countries will dive into that, what helps to basically improve the productivity in your country of producing the improved cook stove. So thereby this was done in a baseline assessment. What exactly are the materials and machinery needed for an improved and better production process? And then the second one, which we'll also dive in later in the country examples is the technical and business training models, which means also including trainings, on the use of the devices that we give, quality control and certification, then also really important health and safety. So what can be done to improve the health and safety on that? In the Senegal presentation, they will dive more deeply also into environmental and social safeguards. How can you manage stock and supply? What is bookkeeping, marketing, and so on to also support there on the technical and business training side. And then basically as an additional one, for intermediate producers, so producers that are already have a higher production capacity, also construction or truck uh, was given or was provided with, and for business class producers, as you've already seen also in the Menti, access to finance is a big issue. So there, there was a higher focus on supporting the access to finance for these producers so they can even scale up more. And then the third designable element that is key for um, this is the performance-based support. So basically there the objective on one hand is for the project risk reduction, reduction, but also to really place a focus on the best performing producers and help them scale up because they then, even if the project leaves or the support is ending, they will be able to scale up their production even further and will be able to keep up kick off a sustainable market growth in the countries as, as you have seen in the graph on the exit file where there was an exponential growth in the market. So basically there the key point is to basically look at the producers that are already in the market, have a performance track record of their production. This is also important then for categorizing them into the three levels. And then basically based on that also supporting them by really checking 
on a longer time period. We have done that in the project for three months where we have verified data, verified sales data to basically only then have like support them when you have this verified sales data. So you can really pick up the best performing producers that are already existing in the market. And then in the implementation stage for accessing the professionalization kit, each producer has to provide a cost contribution. In our case, it was 20%. There will also be some more information on that later in the country presentation, but it's also important to look at your country context and evaluate in your country context, which cost, um, which contribution is the best depends a lot on the financial capacity of the ICS producer. For example, during COVID, the financial de capacity was decreasing majorly. And then always what is part of the performance-based support is safety equipment, which will provide or which we are providing without an own contribution because we want to put a high focus on that this is really important that each producer has the safety equipment in place and is utilizing them. And then depending on how many producers you are supporting and also on how, how far you go with the monitoring, how much you can do the monitoring, for example, you could also do a two-step disbursement of the support packages, depending on specific sales milestones that you set for the producers. And then basically, this would be the three key design elements of the approach. But what is also important to not forget is the distribution chain support. So it's really important to also look at the distribution chain in your country and see how strong it is and so that it's also able to then not only that the improved cooks are not able to reach only the centers but also are enabled to reach in the further remote rural areas so they can really there's they can really go through the market and there's a reach everywhere of the improved cook stoves so you really yeah penetrate the market on all levels and not only in the urban or peri-urban centers so there there was also in terms of our approach there were some support given as like technical entrepreneurship trainings, as well as also performance-based distribution kits of, for example, marketing materials. And another key factor was really linking up distributors with ICS producers. So thereby there are stronger bonds. And then also the distribution can reach further into more remote areas. And then I think this is something when looking at the approach that should always be kept in mind is the supply side doesn't work in a silo, so it's always important to also check the demand side and the enabling environment, because without the demand and without the enabling environment, also the supply side cannot work in a silo. So it's really, when looking, the demand needs to be there. So also think about if behavior, like if behavior change communication could be helpful to be implemented um, or other measures just to also address the demand side, because if you have a market where there is a lot of stoves, but no one is buying the stoves, then also the approach is not working. So it's really important to also sensitize why is an improved cook stove better than the three stone fire? So what what is an argument, like for example, the fuel saving for investing the money into an improved cook stove? And there, for example, within our project, we did some national awareness raising campaigns as well as local grassroots awareness case raising campaigns, for example, door to door campaigns, cooking demonstration, caravan events to also more reach the remote rural areas for that. And then, as said, the enabling environment is also a key factor. So it's always good if there is a already conducive policy framework in place, for example, if clean cooking is already situated in the NDC targets, if there are targets in them defined for clean cooking. If there are clean cooking strategies, like for example, in Kenya, or if there are other clean cooking country plans in place or county plans on a more local level in place. And if there's, for example, a sector coordination or there is already a national label for clean cook stoves. This all will enable that basically there is a sustainable growth for the cook stoves market. And with that, I hand over to my colleague. Yes, on est, on est vraiment désolé euh, pour ça. Normalement, c'est Omar qui devrait faire la, la présentation, vu qu'il est à, dans une région assez reculée. Certainement, ils ont des soucis de connexion. Donc, je vais, je vais commencer la présentation. 
euh, de l'approche du Sénégal. Moi, c'est Madame Eremba Mireya Fouchi. Euh, je suis la directrice adjointe du sous-classe d'accès à l'énergie et je suis la responsable du programme NDEV au Sénégal, GZNDEV. I'm the head of program in Sénégal. So, as Sarah presented it, it's very important to see how we can go to the professionalization of this. Let me remind you that we worked with a, a, a public sector and we found that it was important to go to the transformation of the sector, which is made of dans un secteur économique beaucoup plus fort, doté d'une base technologique et de capacités de gestion d'entreprise suffisante. Alors pourquoi on va vers la professionnalisation de la production C'était important parce qu'il y avait l'impossibilité pour les producteurs artisanaux et professionnels à financer l'augmentation de la production. Ça, c'était un premier point. Le deuxième point, c'est que le sous-secteur n'était pas vraiment attractif pour les institutions financières parce qu'ils ne connaissaient pas. Et vu que c'est le secteur informel, les institutions financières comme les banques ou, ou les institutions microfinances sont frileuses par rapport à, 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 par rapport à cette activité. Insuffisance également de capacité en matière de processus de production. Insufficiency of capacities. So the organization of workshops. The last point is the process of designing ICRs that didn't allow to have for a big amount of production. The next slide, please. So, regarding that, we studied all the processes of the productions for the ICS. In that sense, we thought ourselves that we are going to see all the stages and to act. The first one is the evaluation of needs. So, it was important to see what the producer needs for the preparation of ICS. From that, we work on what we called kits of professionalization. Thirdly, gathering of information. When we got kits, we worked with different categories of producers, artisanal, intermediate, and business class. From that, we knew what producers needed to pass at the level of intermediators, producers, and we organized many meetings of information for producers to present to them if they agree with that, because that was also important. For us, what also was important, it was the awareness of the stakeholders and the project is still in the beginning according to that we discussed for the awareness of grantees there were selection of producers who are producers who got interest they had to show the interest the answer that they got the capacities and they are interested by the package of investments. On that, we bought kits. We made kits. And then we work on the follow up of the awareness of stakeholders, including producers. And now we are in the distribution of the kits. Next slide, please. So one thing also was important in our process, we had to go toward the installation of the projects. We had to work. So for us, it's important to work with 
people of occupations in the implementation of the project of professionalization. So that organization, it's a governmental structure. So for us, it was more about artisanal producers in the designing of the project. The Chamber of Occupations was able to send their members to accompany producers in the process. They accepted also to sign Convention of Cooperation in the organization of workshop of trainings. The Chamber of Occupations was also involved in the organization, the presentation, participation in the sessions of building up capacities. In other processes, the Chamber of Occupations was involved. It was about choosing so to insert them to mobilize Every time it was important to show producers, it was not about to finance, but them also, they had to do something to implement also the recommendations on capacity building. It was not only an accompaniment in terms of kids, not only financial aspects, but there were also non-financial aspects. I'm gonna come back on that. So it was to sustain the financial management, we had to receive their kits. So it was the work of the Chamber of Occupations. They were in charge of receiving kits and to do the follow up. Once the kits have received, it's important to ensure the good use of the kits of professionalization. The next slide, please. The picture is just an example of the meeting that we had with producers. So the kit was made of what? In the buying, the 118 producers that were interested, among them, 75 artisanal and 30 professionals. What are those doors? It just when we, we send information, there are some who said we're interested and does that others come according to the criteria, the quit of professionalization and the package. Here you have the sets what was important in the process of the designing. You got manual machine, you got also motorized infrastructures. Because I said, well, with people who worked in the informal sector, there was a need to professionalize kits for transportation, kits for information, we had laptops that we put at their prop disposal, smartphone as well. So because we wanted to track everything that when it comes to ICS, so kits of safety, I'm sorry. So those are important kits if we want to professionalize the work of producers. Next slide, please. So, we presented the kits of professionalization and different tools. So now we are trying to present investment package. It's about trucks as part of investment package for the transportation of ICS, but also the unity of production, as I said before, so that was also important for producers at certain levels, especially intermediate uh, 
opportunité de, de faire ça. Alors là, quelque partie, par exemple, euh, d'un producteur, c'était d'amener, de mettre à la disposition du projet un terrain euh, viable, loin euh, des habitations, euh, où on pouvait euh, construire l'unité de production. Next slide, please. Alors, le, par rapport à tout ça, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, la contribution propre euh, des producteurs euh, sélectionnés était importante. Comme vous, avez, vous pouvez le voir, on a développé une plateforme euh, sur Excel pour le suivi des versements des contreparties en temps réel. Alors, ces contreparties-là sont également versées dans euh, un compte au niveau de l'association des producteurs, peut-être s'il y a des questions, je reviendrai aussi sur ça. Euh, la sensibilisation, donc c'est important, la sensibilisation continue, soit par les chambres des métiers, soit par nous-mêmes, et le suivi euh, de la contrepartie des producteurs en fonction des kits qu'ils ont choisis, parce qu'il y a différentes compositions qu'on a eu à faire pour le niveau inter, euh, artisanal, le niveau intermédiaire et le niveau business. Alors, on a les 124 producteurs hein, euh, dans les trois fenêtres d'opportunité. Donc là, vous pouvez constater quand même que okay, on a... you can... Notice that we have a good level. 43% of people who brought 100% of what of their production. And you have a regular follow-up that we do. And whenever you bring your... 100%, you have the totality of the equipment, what we do also, when we notice that there is a very good will to see that one brought 50%, and then we also, on our side, bring 50% of what he brought, and we provide, we supply him equipment that will allow him to work. Next slide. So for the management and distribution, you can see that uh, the equipment that we buy, whether they are communication equipment, so it's an entire logistic to put in place. As a project, we can't do everything ourselves. So we have an activity that we externalized, and here we had we signed a contract with a cabinet which will be in charge of the distribution of the equipment. And we intervene in uh, different regions. We have producers almost everywhere in Senegal. And this requires a professional work with uh, external contract who have means today based on an information that we give them they have means to compose and distribute uh, uh, the equipment to the beneficiaries and under the supervision of focal points. Whenever there is uh, a supply, there is a team on the field uh, in terrain who are going to check if they, to make sure the equipment were well received and also at the level of the producers. So the internal platform uh, for the management of equipment is there. So you have seen the simulation we did. My colleague Zania will go into the base of our service provider to make the composition of the producer who submitted or who transferred 50% of his production and also he will receive the composition of the team in, uh, in return and is going to work in the concerned region. Next slide. Here it's an example of uh, the reception of equipment. For example, in the chamber of uh, works in Dakar, 
We have uh, producers in different regions. As I said, not long ago, Diobel is uh, 200 kilometers away from Dakar, Patik 200 kilometers, so Kaolak is almost 400 kilometers away, so Zigensho is almost 600 kilometers away. And this company who cover all these companies, I mean, all these uh, elements, whether it's craft or intermediary, and he makes supplies. So that is a template, for example, of the packaging, I mean, what uh, the company uh, uh, does. Next slide. So other actions of professionalization, it's true that we have a composition of the team with everything we did, we have uh, the set of the equipment that we need, but there are other equipment that are important and which allow us to be more effective in the production and they are forcefully companies that do not do their production using this equipment, but if we mentor them, we take care of them, uh, they will be able to produce those equipment. So in our team, we have a mechanic engineer who looks at the entire production chain, uh, who checks on the inefficiencies in the production of this later, and now he brings the solution and the solution uh, of anything simple to try to solve, to address the inefficiency. He organizes uh, sessions of importation of those tools for the best use of the equipment. There is a training of producers as well in health, security, production, safety. So it's not only the production of tools or investment packages. So there is also financial investment, financial support. Yeah, thank you. So we have uh, health aspects and everything that has to do with safety in the production. Maybe if, the, if there is images, we will share with you. So we have to build capacity in financial management. And uh, I think that is also a very important element, not only equipment. Repetition is very good, but it's very important whether it's a holistic approach to strengthen, I mean, to build capacity in uh, financial management. Uh, so, it's, it's, it's a very important point here. It allows the producer to go to financial institutions to also secure uh, 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 finances. Next slide. Now we can outline actions to be taken on the ground. I won't speak of impact, but the impact can be measured in the long term. So we have to have professionalization actions to take professionalization, professionalization actions. For example, in Senegal, I think for most of you, you know basic equipment that producers had, but now, today, with the team of professionalizations, the investment packages with production uh, units, we can see that the level has improved in terms of production. So here, for example, in terms of a, a counterpart, I think it's, 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 it's very important. Uh, so it's those are millions of, of francs CFA. Uh, Sarah, you can convert the amount into euro for people to see the mobilization of the counterpart on the uh, counterpart on the side of uh, the producers. As I say that uh, what uh, the producers bring, it's also brought on the table, and sometimes. Uh, 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 
We have to take this amount and use it, for example, for virus in order to support the mobilization. So at the level of a certain uh, bank, uh, so so that counterpart allows them to adhere to that mutual of health and also as for the improvement we note the improvement in the organization next slide please next slide sarah sarah alors so we have uh, this part of the equipment which has to do with the investment, but there is a very important requirement. It's the implementation of a management plan, an environmental and social management plan. So we have seen the totality for the producers that we accompany. Almost 46 producers were trained. Uh, we have had a business plan which was a model, a template, so which allowed us to work well. There were 31 producers of intermediary classes, and uh, for the craft, yeah, there were also craftsmen who benefited from this training, including the technicians. Otherwise, uh, uh, at least the technicians can continue to work because with or without the project, they do, there is a follow up. There is a directorate of environment which manages everything that has to do with environment and social. We have a in environmental management plan which accompanies and supports uh, producers in the implementation of the management plan. So according to that, they all received a certificate. And I think it's important to leave documents which are accessible to our producers because most of them are an, an alphabet and they don't have uh, the capacity to read in national languages. So more than 50 producers received what we call individual production equipment. And for modules, the environmental and social integration for it, we had to go to the environmental issues linked to the households that we had to improve. What is environment? For them, the improved household, they have to understand the link between environment and production, environmental impact, risk, and others. All that uh, 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 were trainings that were organized, I mean, done for the producers. So for example, the uh, directives to be res to be respected, we have, they, have to, they have to understand the mechanism of mechanisms of management. Maybe on another slide, I'll come back on it. And we've seen the uh, mechanisms of management for uh, employees, perhaps, who will not be satisfied and uh, we put in place the mechanisms that allow us to have all those plans. So in terms of uh, change, I saw a question uh, where they were asking if there are women in the production unit. In fact, it's cultural, it depends. Maybe in Kenya, I've seen units that are managed by women here, women are part of the production so some women produce they produce and the more and more we see that women are interested in managing and, and we are going to work on it here there is there are no many 
in, in, in Senegal, we see that uh, women are more, more interested in vertical uh, 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 production. Uh, we have metallic support and uh, ceramic, and also uh, um, improved package packaging. Uh, what is the place of uh, women in production? Those were notions that were shared with the producers. And also what is important for us is to see dangerous uh, 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 phenomena. So all those elements are discussed with the producers and we have support that are at their disposals. And we have uh, uh, interns who regular. And how do we identify risks uh, in the production unit. So we discuss about these matters and we go as far as proposing preventing measures. So we also have directive in term, directives in terms of uh, legislation. So they are part of the formation. They also share the laws of what the state accepts in terms of production concerning improved household. So equally, the ventilation of a different zone, it's important. Those are elements uh, that we have. So uh, what, what do we do when we have to throw a line? So we have, they have to use uh, gloves when using a particular tool or a dangerous tool. Next slide. So quickly, I'm sorry, I'm taking more time. Uh, my, is it fine with my time? So here it's the deployment of uh, internal mechanisms in the social environment. In the implementation of this project, I work with an ONGO and we work with uh, 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 locals and in each zone we have people who are in charge of uh, receiving the plants. In Dakar we have Madame Touré, for example, who work with uh, environmental focal points, social focal points, and we have the information how the implications after the treatment and we have, and here for example I can here I can give you an example of what we managed in a best way when we wanted a land for the producer and the state proposed a land and the population did not understand that it's a production company. The population stood up and said they didn't want production units. So they summoned us. We, we proposed a meeting. And now we explain to them. So the interest of that project and uh, the young people of that project can also could also be involved and they straight away accepted and adhere to the project they agreed so that was the mechanism that uh, we try to manage in the best possible way next slide Yes, as usual, in total, I've given you the example of the uh, of the the plant. So, if you check the statistics, we have no. Sorry, it's not plant as I've been saying. Complaint. It's actually complaints. Hundred and forty complaints. Uh, uh, registered. I'm so sorry. It's 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 complaints, not plant, as I've been saying before. So we try to address these complaints 
there are complaints or cases that were made laid against uh, uh, professionals. So there were complaints or cases that were not catastrophic at all. And then we try to address them. Thank you, Sarah. I think, is there another slide? No. Thank you, Madam Emba, for the presentation. Thank you to Madam Emba. Quick introduction of her. She is the project lead in Senegal for the Energizing Development Project. And big thanks for jumping in here, for taking over the presentation. So in case there are any questions on her presentation, feel free to also post in the chat or raise your hand now. Otherwise, we'll jump over to Frederick Amariati, who will present the approach that they're using in Kenya and basically dive in on the trainings specifically and on other parts of the approach that are different than from Senegal to provide you with a holistic picture on what is happening in both countries and to also see the differences in both contexts. So there's one hand raised, yeah. Lavar and Sani, feel free to unmute yourself and post the question in either English or French. Good morning, everyone. Lavar and Sani is my name. I'm an English speaker, so I will ask my question in English. Uh, the adoption rate of the ICS in Senegal is promising. And it is promising in such a way that it will meet the NDC targets. But uh, here in Nigeria, as the most populous country in Africa, I believe we will make enormous contribution if there is serious uh, campaign for the ICS project. But uh, I don't know what the South-South is doing, that uh, projects like this are not uh, cited or initiated in Nigeria. Thank you. Hello. Yes, thank you for posing a quick question. Mireille, we cannot hear you at the moment. See so should I say it again? No, no, we have heard your question. Thank you for okay, okay. So, uh, maybe okay. Maybe, Sarah, okay. can you repeat again? But I, I don't understand very well the, the, the translator. I don't bien compris the translation. I think the question was that what project is contributed to the CDN in Senegal, but it was in Nigeria. Mais la problème est que en Nigeria, on a des problèmes avec le, avec le marché et le marché n'est pas n'est pas comme comparablement comme le marché um, en Sénégal. Et qu'est-ce qu'on doit faire pour commencer ce marché, pour commencer le développement de ce marché? Mm -hmm. Ok. Mais, mais... Merci, merci pour euh, le collègue du, du Nigeria. Hein. Effectivement, je, je pense que peut-être que les problématiques au, au Nigeria ou au Sénégal sont complètement euh, différentes. Hein. Le, le Nigeria est... Like it's in Na Sénégal, because Nigeria is bigger than Sénégal in terms of resources. In Sénégal, uh, really, I can say, so it's long when it comes to ice years, that allowed all those processes to go toward the contribution at the level of industries. The, the target of Senegal is around 800 ice years because we are not far, because each year we can notice there is a progression in terms of production of, of ice years. So we are arm around 500,000, and this year we are targeting to go beyond 500,000 of IFIERS because we are noticing a progression. 
So I believe that I answered well to the concern. Feel free to also post it again in this chat or specialize it in the chat. And then there's one more question. And I think after that question, we'll run over to the presentation of Frederick Amirati. So, Daniel Ramiramana, please feel free yeah. to post your question. Okay, merci beaucoup. Uh, Thank you so much. You said in the beginning of this session that it has been said that the, the, the issue of finance access it's a key issue especially when it comes to producers also for those who are going to use my question is the following do different projects take account of the access to finance? As I said, thank you so much, Daniel, for the question, because it's a key aspect, access finance, access to finance, because what we are doing, the first barrier, or one of the barriers, access to finance, or the exchange of microfinance, a uh, few when it comes to ICRs, they are not yet sure if it's going to be profitable. So, in the process of the professionalization, it's an important point that ensures institutions they got documents. We are accompanying them toward a professional production so that process of personalization it allowed them to increase their capacity of production to have a large market so that they can sell all over in senegal and even beyond senegal because we expect to go in gambia so it this accompaniment non-financial it's also important because all those trainings everything that is about financial management allows them today to have profitable businesses and to go to what banks and to say we got ability of paying back these are the gauge that we can give and in returns microfinance exchange they are comfortable to say we can finance those producers so for me it's what we are doing during this period of accompaniment financial accompaniment or not it allows today to producers to access finance either to what banks or microfinance maybe i'm going to tell my colleague that um, the responsible of, of gender units so if you can grant me two minutes i can say everything that is done today with women we have to continue but feel free to also write in the chat i think it would be great if you can hello Si tu peux utiliser le chat pour élaborer un peu plus, qu'est-ce qu'on fait sur le genre parce que je pense que ça travaille. So that you can elaborate more better what you want to know. And with that, I will hand over to Frederick. He will also dive a bit more in his presentation into the access to finance, but will also focus on the approach in Kenya in terms of once the stove quality as well as the voluntary labeling standards where they're doing great strides. And then we'll also dive into the training there again, focus also on the access to finance, which is a key issue. So with that, I hand over to Frederick Amariati for his presentation. He's an energy professional and also working in the GCF co-finance project since long-term as senior professional. And thank you, Frederick, for your presentation. I hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um... Yeah, I think uh, 
I'm just picking up from where the Senegal team has uh, presented. And uh, I think there's some messages that came across. Professionalization is way bigger than just giving uh, the entrepreneurs machines, tools, equipment. There are other aspects that I think as a, um, as a project we thought about, and that's what I'm here to present. Other aspects of professionalization, apart from giving machines, selecting who receives here and there, etc. So uh, next slide. So I'll focus on about four issues. But before I do that, uh, as Sarah mentioned earlier, this project is implemented both in Kenya and in Senegal. I'll give a quick update of what has happened in Kenya so far, and then focus on those four issues. their are quality assurance, how we are doing these, issues around local content development as solutions to some of the problems we see in the stoves production processes. Then issues on gender mainstreaming. I think a question came out a bit earlier. We can look a bit about that. And then capacity building, trainings, mentorship, etc. Next slide, Sarah. So one of the one of the processes and one of the support we give to entrepreneurs on performance basis, there are a few in Kenya 10 who are benefiting from construction of workshops where they do production from. And what you see on the slide is a typical workshop, example of what we've done in Kenya. Already five are completed. We are completing the final five by the end of, by mid quarter two of the year 2024. So this is what some of our producers have been able to receive. Next slide, Sarah. And Sarah, next slide, please. Yeah, and with regards to other major projects indicators, in Kenya, we do have about 123 stove businesses that we have we are currently supporting. And uh, some of them are limited companies in terms of registration. Some of them are like women groups. And then most some of these are receiving support from us. We've been able to give support 54 producers with the kits, as mentioned earlier by my colleagues from Senegal. And uh, out of all the 54, over 80% of them were able to make their own contribution a very major requirement for the project. Uh, in terms of construction support, I've mentioned that we've already completed five workshops and handed over. We are finalizing the last five and we're looking to finish that by mid quarter two, uh, the coming one or two or three months. We also in more into capacity building. So training our entrepreneurs, those on the project, uh, both in issues, technical trainings, business development and entrepreneurship going beyond gender trainings, ETC. And then as part of what we are doing, we, in terms of enhancing what we're calling the stove testing capacity in Kenya, we've set up two additional stoves testing labs and we're looking to at least set up two more, but within the government, the ministry energy centers, I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then as part of solving problems with our production processes, we have developed what we are calling the local content. I'll provide some more details on the next slide, please, Sarah. So I think just to mention this um, for all of us, the GCF project, we had a criteria for stoves that can be supported. One very important one was the stoves were to be locally manufactured. So those producing were um, local producers, domiciled in Kenya and doing their operations in Kenya. The other requirement was we're doing both firewood and charcoal stoves, and the requirement was more on fuel savings with firewood stoves, achieving at least 40% over and above our baseline stove, which is a three-stone open fire common in most of parts of Africa. And then uh, for charcoal stoves, at least as well as achieves at least 30% fuel savings above our baseline stove in Kenya. We have a famous stove, we call it KCJ, it's been here since the 80s and we're trying to see if we can get solutions that surpass its performance. All these stoves in terms of testing, they were to, they were to be based on a controlled cooking test protocol. Um, and we're doing this, as I'll mention again later with the, the testing agents in Kenya, the only one that's accredited to do that. Next slide, Sarah. So among the issues that we're dealing with, even as we support our entrepreneurs, is issues around the quality of the stoves that we are dealing with. Next slide. Uh, when we talk about quality, we talk about the stoves that are in the market or been pushed into the market. And I think for us, these are not all the issues. The two main issues that came up were issues of standards. So we do have standards in the country, but majority of them 
cannot be met by most of our entrepreneurs. And so, and the other now issue is uh, the issue of inconsistency within the quality that what we have in the market. So one of the things we've done is a market surveillance of the stops in the market. And uh, we realize none of these meets the, very few of these meet the WHO requirements on um, issues around the emissions, ETC. So what we're offering as a project is we're working on what we're calling a voluntary label for biomass stops, which we are currently working to roll out in Kenya. And then we're doing what we call calling periodic stops quality surveys or surveillance using the additional stops testing labs that we have. This is becoming easier for us. And with the two, actually now the four ones we are done, we realize the space will be at a point, the sector in Kenya will be at a point where we no longer have the same challenges we had. Maybe to bring it on uh, with the only testing agency in Kenya, it could take a bit longer for you to get your results when you submit your stuff. But we think with the additional four, this should be easier to enable our entrepreneurs to operate more, to innovate more, and get the test, test results on time. Next slide. So yeah, just a quick recap on the surveillance. We do this together with the the Kenya Industrial Research and Development Institute, KIRDI, that's a testing agency in Kenya. And we are hoping that the additional two, which we are setting in the institutions at Strathmore and Dedan Kimathi will be able to support these activities in the country. Next slide. So yeah, coming down to the label, this, we have come up with a couple of labels and we're looking at this as a pathway towards standardization we have drafted some labels. We have already sought um, comments from the stakeholders on which will be the best. And the one I show here is the one that most likely is emerging as the best one for from the stakeholders engagement that was done. We are waiting for decision from the consultant and then we plan for the rollout starting quarter two of the year 2024. The next slide, which also shows a few of the other labels that were um, tried. Yeah, and in terms of piloting, we're looking to do with some of our 40, up to 40 selected entrepreneurs that we are supporting to see how best this goes before we do the massive rollout. Uh, what I would say is for every voluntary labeling program, I think our communication strategy is a very important aspect and we already have one being finalized by the consultant. So once the two are done, we roll out the massive rollout program for this. Next slide. So yeah, the issue number two for us that we're looking to and has been coming up is the issue of ergonomics and firing challenges in this space. Next slide. So when we talk about ergonomics, most of us have been to stoves production centers, uh, especially those that make stoves from clay, the ceramic liners. You look at the mixing process. This is mostly done by using our feet. You know, what we do is we step on the clay until it achieves some kind of uniformity before we use it for the next processes. And so you realize this stepping and using our feet is not, it becomes an ergonomic challenge. We yet to understand or find out more about the health issues that come up from that, but we think for us that's a big problem. One, it's ergonomics issue. Number two, in terms of the output of the mixing process, it may not be uniform enough to assure quality of the stoves down the production line. So for us, it's something we're working to do and maybe challenge number two comes around with the, the firing processes. The main unit for producing a stove in a cera is a ceramic liner. Once you do the molding, you're supposed to fire it. Our current kilns do not really assure a number of things. And one, there is a firing conditions. Most of them variable, so you realize the output from the firing process cannot be assured fully. And this is something that we have a few solutions for which we're trying to do with our entrepreneurs. One is we've come up with a mechanized clay mixer. I'll be able to show you in the next slide how it works. And then we have um, what you're calling the improved ceramic liner firing kilns. Again, I will show you in the next slide. Next slide, Sarah. And so, yeah, in terms of uh, what we call it, the clay mixers as, as examples. So we we're just making sure that we have a machine, a mechanical item that can support the mixing process, moving this away from the way it's currently being done. And the other thing we're trying to do is uh, beyond just this one mixer, we're hoping that we can do two production lines fully or rather semi-automated 
and do that within our two government centers, the energy centers. This will be used as centers of excellence for trainings and all that for anyone else who would like to know how to do stocks production. Uh, next slide, sir. Yeah, so back to the mixer, sir. I don't know if you can play that, that video quickly as I talk a bit about it. So yeah, so if you look at uh, the way it is, If it, all right so uh, i think when we share this everyone else will be able to see how it works but the question is we're simply saying instead of us mixing manually we are using such equipments to be able to achieve um what do you call it to achieve a uh, uniform material to be used for the next processes in the molding if for, for molding next next slide sir so yeah, in terms of kilns, you can look at the kiln on your left. That's what we currently do have. We've, together with the technical partner, one of the university institutions on the project, we have come up with what we're calling an improved kiln, as you'll see on the right. More assured firing conditions. You're able to vary the capacity of liners that you're firing at any one point, reduces the time you require to do firing quite significantly by over, almost over 50%. And this is something we're trying to see. There are few producers who will be able to benefit from this. Others have these designs available to use them to access more funds and set it up in the production centers. Next slide. Then issues of gender mainstreaming again in the value chain. Next slide, Sarah. I think uh, issues that came up, we see this as a slightly male-dominated field, but I promise you the picture in Kenya says something else. But this mostly in what we call the most profitable nodes of the value chain. So there's the value addition bit and the marketing bit. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So so the the most profitable nodes of the value chain, the ones we're talking about, more mostly male dominated. Um, the other bit is uh, we do not have special conditions for women in this such a project. So issues that come up and women have more questions raising up. Do we have special considerations for them or not? And then we have uh, challenges related to timing of activities. So most of activities, sometimes you realize you're doing them away from uh, where women have to leave their households to go further to attend these activities. Challenges that are very common. And then our approach in the next slide, Sarah. Yeah, so what we see, uh, what we've discovered is this growing interest from women in this value chain. So if you look at uh, the total number of producers that we have, the 130, over 60% are female, which is a very good, good indication for us. Uh, if you are. And then we are trying to have dedicated capacity building sessions for women entrepreneurs. This is open, any request is accommodated. And then we see majority, a good number of them uh, benefiting from the professional support that we are giving, which for us is a good indicator uh, that uh, we're really doing well in terms of ensuring that gender gender is mainstreamed within our activities. And then like we've seen a couple of trainings for women who want to go into the most uh, profitable uh, nodes of the value chain, issues around cladding, fabrication, ETC, which is a place where there's more money. A very good way of uh, bringing women on board in such aspects. Next slide, sir. And then now issues of capacity building mentioned earlier for entrepreneurs. Next slide. Uh, we realized that the kits, like I mentioned earlier, machines are not adequate to enable professionalization. So we also focus on the other skills. And then we do capacity building from a technical perspective. And then we also do mentorship for entrepreneurs. And then we have a focus on access to market-based finance. So in technical issues, we train and retrain our entrepreneurs on production processes, kill construction, safe use, and maintenance of these items, the equipment we are giving them out, but also trainings on value addition uh, for, the, for the stove so that at least we make more money from these processes. And then we have um, a mentorship program that we're doing for some of our best performing entrepreneurs. Uh, we're supporting them to develop what we're calling investment plans, which they can use to access funds or finance elsewhere. We are doing sensitization uh, activities around financial prudence in their operations, 
uh, how to formalize the operations, businesses, etc. So what we do is we work alongside them to do all this um, so that at least they are able to stand on their own even after we are gone in terms of issues around access to finance. Next slide, Sarah. Yeah, and so I think as I finish, Sarah, is just to say, so when you talk about professionalization, I think it's well beyond just the machines, tools, equipment, but there are other aspects that come in that we really need to focus on and which we are doing as a project, providing the soft skills, uh, supporting the wider sector in assuring quality issues like now with the voluntary labeling programs, enhancing the cost of testing capacity, setting up new labs, etc. Coming up as very helpful in some of these processes. Sarah, that's it from me. Any questions? Happy to respond. Thank you, Frederick, for the presentation. There's one question in the chat, but since we're already over running over time, wait, I mean, there are two questions. Um, actually, maybe let's take one question in, and I think then we need to close since we're already running over time. So there's one question that the demand for stoves is more and more important um, in zones that are urban and rural. Um, how is um, is the Kenya project as well as the Senegal project, so to you both, considering uh, the, the production in both? Uh, so to also cover urban as well as rural areas. Maybe, Frederick, you can present from a Kenya perspective on the question. Yes, so Sarah, Sarah, I think just to mention that the focus of this project largely is the rural areas. Let me start from there, um, where most of the guys using these stoves reside. So the stoves we are doing are a bit um, are commonly used in rural areas. So we are open, but I'm not saying that the urban areas are not candidates for this. Actually, some of our entrepreneurs that we are supporting are within urban areas. We have identified them and we know where they are. Some of them are in towns. Those of us in Kenya, we have some guys in Meru, Muranga. But if you look at most of the operations, they are a bit in the rural contexts where we think the target market for these solutions are really are. Sarah. Thank you. I hope the question was answered. Otherwise, feel free to come in the chat. And then one last question and then we'll close. Um, so basically, there's one more question in the chat that is saying that basically from female producers, um, a lot of them are on artisanal level and is asking why is that? And um, yeah, I guess also then the question, how can we lift them up or like how can we increase their production level? Maybe Frederick, you can quickly come in and I think then we'll close. Yeah, unfortunately, sir, I would also say our approach to this project is market-based, actually performance-based. So the current analysis uh, partly agrees with the conclusion that majority of the women entrepreneurs are artisanal. But from uh, the Kenyan context, there are women entrepreneurs who are in professional, and some of them have potential to move into uh, business class, and that's what we are working towards. But uh, to the question on how we're doing that, from our end, there's a mentorship process that we are doing with our entrepreneurs. So we have identified about 30 to 40 entrepreneurs <clears throat> that we are focusing really on, and some of them are female entrepreneurs. So we are providing what we're calling dedicated or customized support to enable them be able to move from one level to another. Uh, in terms of requesting for support, for majority of them, we've always taken time to show them what we are able to offer in terms of machines, tools, and equipment. And as they select whatever they would like to request from the project, we guide them accordingly based on what is able to another. So there's this dedicated support that we are supporting, providing to women entrepreneurs. And uh, we have put it as a, one of our major areas of focus. From the, the business class, professional class entrepreneurs, we hope we can get at least 50 50% by the end of the project. But again, that's something we cannot assure because this is a, the approach here is market-based, performance-based. It all depends with how best you perform, you know. That's what I would say, Sarah. Thank you, Frederick. And I think I will use that as to, hand to lead over to the closing. So first of all, I would like to thank all the presenters of today to present the different aspects. I think it was really clear also from the presentation that to the professionalization approach, it's really important to take the context into consideration and target it 
towards the local context that is there in your country. You've seen in the example of Kenya and Senegal that there were different focus areas, took different avenues, talks also in terms of how to support and targeting that to the local needs. And as said, also, I think this was at the beginning, and this is also where Frederick's presentation closed, access to finance is a key point that is also taken up in the approach, as well as how to scale up the production. So you will see now on your screen a little survey. Feel free to fill that in to rate um, how you feel the webinar was, if it was helpful or not. After this webinar, we will also share the presentations with you in English and French, and we will also share the professionalization guide with you after this webinar. So thank you and big thank you also to South South North for giving us the platform to share our experience on the professionalization approach. And with that, I hand over to Josh for his closing remarks. Thank you very much, Sarah. I know we are over time and uh, not very much to add other than to say thank you to you and to all of our partners for the continued collaboration on this. I think it was an excellent opportunity to share and again, very well uh, delivered. Thank you for the presentations, both to Frederick and to Omar and, and Mireille for stepping in. And thank you all for your patience with the technical issues. And we look forward to having another session um, as Sarah mentioned, um, we shall be doing the post comms and sharing all of this information. I know there are one or two questions that may be um, uh, remaining on there. We will see if those can also be answered and included in the post communication. But definitely, please keep an eye out for any information regarding follow ups and in the post comms, you will receive this as well. So once again, thank you to everybody for taking the time for joining us. And thank you so much to Sarah and to all of our partners for making this possible. Have a lovely day, everybody, and uh, we shall see you again soon. Bye-bye.